Hello and welcome to NSO Developer Days. Uh, I'm Victoria Ferdas, NSO Core Engineer, and I'm going to be your host for this session. We have two speakers here, Samuel and Alan, consultants at uh, Secune Ethics. Today, they are going to present their talk titled NSO in the Enterprise. Samuel and Alan, are you ready? The stage is yours. Thanks, Victoria. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Sam and uh, Alan. Yes. Hi, I'm Alan. And welcome and thanks for joining us here in NSO and the Enterprise, where we'll talk about a few aspects about our experience implementing NSO in a brownfield enterprise. The subtitle of our talk is Weaving the Old into the New, which is a reference to the show Westworld, but we think that also captures the spirit of what we're trying to do with NSO. So, as I said, this talk is given by me, Alan Chen, and my colleague Samuel Fu, just by Sam. I won't bore you with our bios now, but if you want to know more about us, please check out our speaker bios in the event app. And feel free to reach out to us during or after developer days to chat. Now, in the first part of this talk, I will speak gen generally about our goals with NSO and some of the high level challenges we faced. Sam will then dive deeply into one of the specific types of challenges we faced and how we ended up solving it. Uh, next slide, please. So we are both consultants at Secunetics. Uh, we're an engineering consultancy based in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, Secunetics provides network engineering for large networks. We focus in several main areas, architecture design and deployment, automation and orchestration, performance engineering and management, security engineering analysis and response and we serve both government and commercial organizations. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we are trying to use a poll. Um, hopefully it shows up in the event app now. Um, yeah, it does show up. It looks like it is only a select one answer instead of a all that apply. Oh, OK. Well, select the best answer that you have then. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll move on and look at the results later. Let's go to the next slide. So our NSO journey starts with a brownfield enterprise. It's, it's very brown. In fact, this organization is older than me and I'm older than I look. So that give you an idea. Uh, this organization is made up of over 10 separate departments. Each department managed their own network. And this means different choices in technology, vendors, architecture, etc. So as you in the environment. Across all those departments, there are about 1,200 or so different network devices across many different vendors. Even within a single vendor, there can be a wide range of models and OS versions. And this is all configured by hand by different groups of people using different processes over decades. Next slide. So some years ago, it was rightly decided that these networks should all be centrally managed. There are still some holdouts, um, but most of them are managed by a single department now. However, it's still by a team of CLI Cowboys. And this means that each person does things differently, resulting in inconsistent configurations. And this is when we were brought in to perform an assessment of the network, identify areas of improvement, and then to implement those improvements. To bring our customer to a cutting edge network, we developed a plan that involves elements such as network performance management, security, network re-architecture, configuration standardization, and of course, network orchestration, which is where NSO comes into our picture. Right, next slide. So this was our first experience with NSO. Uh, so we experienced some learning curves and ran into a number of challenges. And here's just a high level list of some of the ones we ran into. Um, first, NEDs often lack support for the types of configurations we needed. Um, is our enterprise use case unusual? Maybe yes, maybe no, we're not sure, but it often seemed like pretty basic commands were often not supported or not correctly supported by the NEDs. For example, sometimes we, uh, we found that it didn't support, uh, the Cisco iOS NEDs specifically didn't support um, per correctly configuring SNMP v3 in forms. Uh, or even configuring something as simple as wiki white lines. Um, and I'd say throughout our whole development process, we spent more time waiting for tech cases to be resolved than that. So that surprised us. Um, 
we had a lack of a representative test environment. Um, due to the way of the nature of funding works for our customer, it was basically impossible to have a, a proper working test environment. Any lab devices that would become available would eventually get snatched for emergency situations and never replaced. So we just really didn't have proper test environment. So you might ask, why not just use virtual test devices? Well, virtual test devices just aren't good enough. We do use things like CSRs and NX OSVs, uh, but in many cases, we found that they just don't act enough like real network devices to be um, useful for complete testing. Um, another problem that we run into is most configurations are currently still out of band of NSO. Now, our plan is for NSO to take 100% control over the network configurations, but that's going to take a while. So that means in the meantime, the CLI Cowboys will be continuing to make their configuration changes directly to network devices out of hand. So keeping things in sync is pretty challenging. Uh, we, run, we have a wide variety of vendors and models, um, and more NEDs means more development. We currently have about 10 different NEDs in play, and the number of vendors and models essentially becomes a multiplier in terms of the time and effort needed to develop a service for each network standard. Um, so uh, another issue is that we have a very wide variation of devices under a single node. Uh, from our experience, whether a command is supported by a device depends on its model, OS version, and licensing. There, there may even be other factors we haven't figured out. But for um, well, we have over 200 unique combinations of model and OS version using the Cisco iOS net alone. So it is this last challenge that we will dive a bit deeper into uh, so you can see how we went about solving it. And for that, I will turn this over to Sam. Thanks, Alan. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so under a single NED or even just dealing with NEDs in general, um, we did make a couple assumptions going in. Um, some of the assumptions were we assumed that the NED would be able to configure and parse all the configuration on the device. Um, so as you can see here, uh, this is inside one of the trace logs for a device. Um, we have a number of lines skipped, six lines, and it's because the NED doesn't know how to parse them. You see what they are right here. Um, this led to us opening up quite a few TAC cases and uh, slowed down some of the development process. Uh, another assumption we had is um, we assumed the NED would not allow you to configure commands the device did not support. Um, and as you can see here, the NED supports the command NTP update calendar, um, but the device does not, and we get an error when pushing this command to the device. Uh, so our other polling question is in, in relation to this is, do you have, uh, have you had, have you had issues where the net allowed you to configure commands the device didn't support? Um, and, and the reason for this is because other devices under the same net do support the command, uh, but the net doesn't know which devices support it and which do not. So this is really the first encounter of old meets new. Um, in testing, uh, our virtual device, the Cisco, you know, under the Cisco iOS net, the CSR 1000V did not support the command NTP update calendar. Um, looking into it, that's understandable. NTP update calendar is a command that syncs software clock to hardware clock. The virtual device probably doesn't have a hardware clock. So, okay, it makes sense. We move into production. We just add a little, you know, skip over this command for this device. We get in production. We run into the same problem um, on multiple physical devices. Um, so not just one, but multiple devices. It turns out it's a uh, uh, it's it's a it's a hardware model issue, and it's related to you know higher end hardware models support the command, lower end ones do not. Um, so our first service deployment was was a failure, um, and and we had a lot of struggle with with running into these atomic transactions where it fail, roll back, and then we had to go and figure out which devices were failing and and what to do about it. Um, one of the interesting things too with our use case of enterprise wide services such as NTP is it's not, um, it, the entire service doesn't have to be atomic. Uh, it's a best effort type service. So if it doesn't support NTP update calendar on the command, we still want to push the rest of the configuration to the device. Um, so that, that is a little bit of a different use case here. Um, because we ended up running into devices that don't support the command, we, we need to be able to figure out what those devices are before trying all the devices, especially devices uh, you know, that are core routers or core devices in the network. We don't want to be hitting those with commands that, um, you know, that they're not going to support. Um, 
So what we do is we create a, a, a device group of canary devices. Um, these canary devices uh, consist of one of each device model per net. So as, as Alan had said, um, within the single net, we had over 200 unique combinations of operating system to hardware model, uh, but there were about 80 unique hardware models. So we had a device group of about 80 devices in our canary devices. We can test those, and then if those all pass, we can feel much more confident moving forward. Um, so this is kind of testing in production, but it's just because the test environment we have, the virtual devices, they're not good enough. So we have to, you know, make these, um, you know, things to, to be able to move forward. Um, so the Canary device group acts as the initial compatibility test for the service then. Uh, what we do after the initial Canary device group, so we try these devices, any of them that fail, we can use service template lookups on that platform to skip over the command. So we try the service on these Canary devices, we enumerate a list of all the devices that fail to command, we add their model to an if statement inside of the XML template of the service to skip that command. Uh, once again, we're okay with skipping these commands because it's, it's a best effort because uh, it's an enterprise-wide service. It's not a specific subset. It's all the devices in the enterprise we want to push this to. And that's the deployment of a minimum mandatory configuration, and the rest is best effort, such as these um, commands like NTP update calendar. Uh, however, after we do this, then we have to, you know, up, add, update and edit the service XML template. We have to reload the packages, redeploy the service. Um, in our enterprise environment, we have HA configured, so you have to turn it down on each one of those reload the packages, make turn HA back on, make sure everything's working. It's, it's a very slow, uh, tedious process. Um, so that's some of the pain. So we figured, can we check this beforehand um, instead of just trying to deploy the device and having it fail? And we can, and, and here are being shown a couple examples. NSO has this config exec. Um, so instead of having to go through the CDB and do transactions, uh, we can instead just send the device a command and config exec sends it in configuration mode and just as as um, you know a CLI cowboy would do on typing the command line you use a question mark at the end of the command to see what's supported uh, if you type out the whole command with question mark um, in the right panel you see we get the two carriage returns or one carriage return sometimes um, that means the command supported we're on on the left panel there you see in the update calendar we get unrecognized command so now we can check these devices um, in our device group to see if they're supported, uh, if they support the command before trying to push the service to them. Um, but doing that one device at a time is, is not very easy. Uh, it's not very fun. And the config exec only works on a single device. You can't config exec a device group. Um, talking to some of the developers, there were some concerns. I remember one of them was if, if the device group had multiple devices from different NEDs. Uh, I don't remember all of the concerns, but we thought we could we could program around this and just you could feed a device group or a list of devices. You specify the namespace or the net you want to use and, and go from there. So we created a tool called bulk execution, or we call it bulk exec for short. Um, and basically what this is, is augmenting NSO's existing capabilities. Uh, NSO is a platform, uh, so it's, it's built to be augmented upon. Uh, what this action does is it's a multi-threaded Python action. Um, so a thread per device. Um, you feed it devices, you can feed it from a device group, you can just feed a list of devices, a uh, single device, however you want to do it, um, and it will run a live status or config exec command on each device uh, that you provide it. This is nice in case you have uh, groups such as your core distribution, access layer, if you have different site locations, you can have groups for that. If you just need to do a quick on the fly on maybe three or four devices, you don't have to do it one at a time, you can feed it as a list. Um, much easier to use, you can, and you can do it massive in scale. So this really gives you scalability and command checking. So here's a quick little example of it. Um, so as you can see here, we're running out on device group iOS canaries, as I had showed earlier. We see the three devices, and we can see their responses. So we can see the command output and then whether or not the config is supported. Uh, so two of the devices do support the command, one of them does not. And we even put model OS type and OS version there on the side just for a little bit more information for the user. Um, so that's great, but there are some edge cases. Um, unlike NTP update calendar, we, we found some other commands while going through and creating services that uh, it's not just model based, it's OS based. Um, and so one, 
we had we had a couple of devices, exact same hardware, different operating system. One one device supported the command, the other one did not. Uh, and then in red here is licenses, and it's in red because that's that's really the pain point. That's where it was really uh, really painful, and, and we really had to think about this when to solve this cases for licenses. Um, because one, NSO doesn't grab licenses by default. If you use NSO, you probably know it grabs platform like OS and model by default. It stores that you can look it up easily in the CDB. Licenses, it does not, as well as it's not one license per device like OS and model. You can have multiple licenses on, the, on a single device. And with our already existing complexity of plus 80 models, plus 200 OS to model combinations, I, we, actually, we didn't even look into the combination of licenses to OS to model, um, just because the complexity tree was growing too large. So that's a big edge case. Um, another one as well is new devices that come into the network. Um, they bring new model OS combinations as well as licenses. Um, and so this will give you perhaps new failures where you have to update the service again, where you have to once again go in, update the template, turn off HA, reload the packages, turn on HA, you know, this long, slow process. Um, and and so it's, it's just a, it's a moving target area, right? And so what did we do? We came up with something called config support. And down here, you'll notice uh, Victor replying to me on the developer hub. We were having a nice conversation, but highlighted in blue is kind of the fun part uh, where he says, I'm a little bit afraid to ask what config support is. Uh, that's all right, Victor, you don't have to ask. We're going to tell you. Um, basically what it is, it's the modification to the NSO CDB schema. Um, all it does is it associates a device name to a command and it marks if the command is not supported. So very simple structure modification, uh, very easy association, um, just nice and simple. What does that mean? So here you can see we, we're going into the NSO. We're saying config support for device name CSR, command NTP update calendar. Uh, we see that one of the options is support. I'm gonna put support to false. Uh, and then we can commit that. So instead of inside of our XML templates saying that this uh, model or this OS uh, doesn't support a command, we can just say this device does not support the command, store that in the CDB. Because it's stored in the CDB, we can now revisit service templates. So similar to, as I was just stating with before we were looking up model or OS, all we really have to do now is look up do one lookup command. Um, so same methodology, but it's one lookup command that covers all devices for service, regardless of platform or license. Uh, prior, we had to enter in every single model or OS combination inside of that if statement. So as a, some of them would became over 20 plus lines long. Um, here is a single command though, um, because it looks up for the device that you're currently applying the service to for this command, if it's still, it's, um, so if it's not false, so basically true. Um, so when it is false, it won't apply the command. Uh, the, the lookup is just being done within NSO. So you no longer have to update the XML template, turn off HA, reload packages. Instead, what you do is you just enter in a new config support entry as the last slide showed, and then the service will now just look up that config support entry for applying the service. However, doing an entry per device when you have over a thousand devices um, per command when you have more than just the single NTP update calendar command can become um, a pretty burdensome tax task. But we have bulk exec and config support and bulk exec already has all the information and it's already running in NSO. So why don't we just store the results from bulk exec into config support? Um, so that's exactly what we did. Um, then all you have to do um, to update the support for a service is run bulk exec on that device for that service, for that command. Um, you no longer have to modify the template, no longer have to reload packages. Everything is within NSO and it just works and it's easy. Um, so after you run the bulk exec for the config, config support, then you just redeploy the service and that rechecks that XPath um, for the config support lookup. So if the status has changed, then the commands that it sent to the device also just changes in line. So, Here's what that looks like. Um, you can see that there's a little date timestamp up at the top. Um, we'll come to that later. You can see there's currently no config support entry for CSR1. Um, and so now we're gonna run the bulk exec for populating config support. We're gonna run on iOS canaries and we're gonna run on TP update calendar. 
So same results we got before when we first ran bulk exec. Uh, but now you can see that it created an entry and can fix it for, for CSR command NTP update calendar. So now if we look, we see that there is an entry for the CSR, the command, the support is false, and it marks the timestamp as well. Uh, the timestamp is just like a nice little thing on top, uh, just because if people sometimes don't follow processes, maybe it's been two years um, and nobody has rechecked this command. Um, the reason that's important is sometimes OSs will get upgraded and maybe they do support the command. Uh, licenses will get upgraded, they may support the command, uh, or, and then har hardware refreshes will happen as well. Um, so of course you want this to get caught in your processes, you want this to all be in line, um, but whenever you're using a new product like we are here with NSL, sometimes processes get missed, so having a timestamp is nice to always have something to reference. Um, but something else is required for, for ease of use. So now we can run the command on any number of devices, store it within NSL CDB, but that's running it on a single command. And NTP may be simple, but uh, different services such as SNMP or, or, or NetFlow, uh, these ones may have more commands that we need to check. So how do you know all the, the commands for a service, especially when it's two years after the service was created and maybe the developer is left and somebody on operations has to run this because there's a new device. So you need to know all the commands for a service. Um, you also need to know which commands are being looked up in the service template, because if you just type any command into the config support, it will have no effect. It only has an effect if the service template looks it up. Um, so you need to know exactly the, the right syntax, what command is being looked into. Um, and you have to be able to perform the compatibility check prior to the error occurring. Um, and that, that's just for ease of use. You, you can do it after, but if a new device is coming in, you just want to be able to check the commands for the service. Uh, you know, best effort, skip the ones that aren't supported, move forward with the ones that are, um, rather than running into these errors, especially with atomic transactions, if you're doing multiple devices, it's, it's easier to do it up front um, and, ch and check them all. Uh, so of course we can just put all of the commands for a service inside of a file. It makes perfect sense. Um, so you just feed the bulk exec a file. Uh, the file acts as a batch file for testing all commands for a service. Uh, you run the file on all the devices for a new service. Um, so we could check all 800 devices uh, with a single file, which has maybe 5, 10, 20 commands listed for that service, which checks all of them. It's, um, uh, it's a parallel running Python action, so you can check all the devices simultaneously so it runs at a better speed. Um, and you can store those results uh, into the CDB after with automation, so you don't have to do anything yourself. Um, this file also exists later for when there are new devices, you know, a week, a month, six months, one year later, you can just run it, this file on the device, all the commands are there pre-packaged, just like the services, it knows what to look up, um, and it's good. So here we can see I'm gonna run, just on a single device CSR here, we're gonna run the file NTP uh, from file. So all the commands for the NTP service that I needed to check here. Uh, so it's just a short, quick example, right? Don't wanna fill up the whole screen, but I'm checking NTP logging, NTP update calendar. You can see um, in the command output, one supported, one's not. Uh, the, the cool thing, an interesting thing down below, though, is we see one is updated, uh, the other is deleted. Um, updated uh, just means that the support status may have been updated and the, the timestamp is updated, which is nice. Um, the deleted one is, is interesting because in, in this mock use case here, what it's demonstrating is that this device CSR1 previously did not support NTP logging. Um, we ran this command audit, now it does support it. We can see the config support EGS. Um, and so it's been deleted from the config support database because we only care if it's false. If it's true, it might as well not exist because there's no reason to store it. We expect most to be true. It will save us some space. So that's pretty cool. But that's not it. Uh, that's not everything. It's not going to cover our use case um, because we need to be able to manually override the automation. And the reason for that is automation can only be as good as the information you work with. And these devices weren't built with automation in mind. There's not an API at Cisco.com where I can ask, what are all the commands this device supports? Um, and the devices lie sometimes, right? We try to tell them, don't lie, it's not good to lie, but they'll, they'll lie to you. Um, and we get lies both directions, false positives, false negatives. Um, with a false positive, uh, right, is an, on say like an ASR 1001 or 1002 device, the gig 0 interface will tell you it supports NetFlow commands. You try to send it to it. It doesn't support it because it's a management interface. So the devices will lie saying they do support commands. We've gotten the other way devices will lie saying they don't support commands. You send the device the command, it accepts it, and then it says it's deprecated, but it takes the command. 
Um, so you do have to be able to manually override your automation. Um, you need to be able to manually set the status, the support status of a command for line devices. So we just called it manually set. You just put it in the config support for that command device command to device association. Um, and basically all it does is it marks the command as immutable against automation. So against the bulk exec. Immutable meaning um, it, it won't be changed. Um, so here I'm just doing a quick showing. Uh, I'm going in for the device CSR1 under config support for the command NTP logging, manually setting it um, to false. So I'm setting it to support to false and I'm just marking it manually set. So basically making it immutable so that the automation um, won't modify it. And it's manually sets just a presence container. And you can see when I run it, it just comes back pretty quick and instantly. Um, it tried the command, it shows the command is supported, um, but in the status, it says information returned to this for the device may be false. Um, the device has been manually set in the CDB. So it informs the user, first off, what the device actually responds with in case maybe the device has been upgraded and you want to remove the manually set. But it also tells you the device might be lying to you, so maybe you should go into some manual investigation. Um, and you can see at the bottom there, instead of updated, changed, created, deleted, we have unchanged, and it says due to be manually set. So we're constantly giving the user feedback on these commands. Um, and so there we, that's, that's, actually, that's the whole solution package right there for dealing with this complexity. Um, and the summary takeaway from our automation journey is just that your existing environment may not have been engineered with automation in mind. Um, yeah, and, and the other, NSO is a platform. Um, you wanna augment its current capabilities. Uh, for diverse environments, uh, you do require flexibility, scalability, and tracking of your solutions. Um, and it, it really is a tricky thing to weave the old into the new, but it can be done. All right, uh, thank you. That, that is our presentation. Are there any questions from the audience? So, okay. so someone, I have a question, um, actually myself. I think it's, uh, it, it's very cool what you guys did. Congratulations. I was wondering if uh, we can uh, have a look uh, at it. Uh, maybe are you planning to share somehow what you've done? Uh, maybe on the developer hub or Git? So yeah, so currently we're, we're not sharing the, the, the code or the, the, the code that we developed for it. Um, that, that's just like a decision that's been made at the company level is at the current moment we're not doing that um, we may do that later uh, there is discussion at it but when that is i i don't know um, if anyone has any questions feel free to message me on the developer hub i've, I've asked some questions there as well um, and i can help you with um, you know something you have questions with but we're currently not sharing the uh, code for it Okay, so it's it's time for questions, and, and I would suggest for for the audience to uh, to post your questions in this WebEx chat, um, or or use the Cisco Event App session chat for this session to post questions. Uh, while you do that, I I already have a question as well. So why did you use services instead of uh, device templates? Uh, I guess I can take that. Um, so there, there are several reasons. I mean, we definitely did think about using device templates, and I think we may use them into the future. But uh, some of the main reasons we looked at were we really wanted something that was a full life cycle, not just deploying, being able to deploy the uh, configuration, but also being able to check the, its presence in the removal of those potential services. Um, uh, and also just due to the how heterogeneous our environments were. And you've seen what Sam was showing, like the, there's a lot of complex logic that has to be built into these templates now because of dealing with these types of situations. So that just made it much more natural to use a service. Okay, thank you. We, we already got some questions, some more questions. So, um, the, the first question is, did you, find, uh, did you face any issues with the uh, NSO CDB when using config support, especially with regards to NSO CDB getting polluted? Uh, so I'll talk a little bit to that. Uh, Alan, feel free to add on if, if you have anything I missed. Um, we haven't ran into any issues with the CDB yet. Um, a lot of it is um, 
like so the, yeah so the way it is it's a device and a bunch of command entries under it um and then with those command entries you'll have like support basically to true or false and a timestamp um so that's about three lines per command per device which which can add up um and we are actually concerned about one thing currently is for interfaces because interfaces we just want to do interface type per device such as gigabit ethernet 10 gig ethernet per device um, but we even found out as in the example i gave with the asr um, that sometimes even just the interface type isn't consistent across the device so a gig zero zero on an asr um, device will not support certain commands because it's management interface um, but the other gigabit ethernet ones will um, so now we have to check basically all of the interfaces for the device and store an entry for each one of them. Um, that is the reason we decide only to store entries that are false or manually set to true is because there's no reason to store the true values. Uh, if, if, if we look it up and there's nothing there, it's assumed to be true. Um, we, we had considered other ways of storing to try to reduce it, but yeah, this was the simplest way. We haven't run into any memory issues yet. Um, Alan, could, could you speak to the memory for how much memory we currently have on, on the device, just in case I don't know what pe other people are using, but I don't think we're even using half of the allocated memory for NSO. Yeah, I think the I think the servers we have for NSO, I think they have 32 gigabytes of RAM, and I think in our technical use, just you know, using looking at top, I think we see usually less than 16. So yeah, I think we're fine in terms of RAM so far. All right, next question. Uh, is there any DevNet or other way to test this at uh, lab instance? Um, yeah, I think we would like to know if there were. <laughs> we haven't found it. Uh, yeah, for, for our testing, we've just been using uh, NetSims, virtual devices, whether it's like CSR, iOS Vs. Um, we have like a GNS3 setup going on for some virtual devices. Um, and I think we have like a couple hardware devices, but it's nothing compared to the complexity of the real environment. And so there's a little bit of testing in production, which is why we use Canary devices, right? You don't want to take down a core device by maybe giving the wrong command or making a change to something that's been there for 10 years and nobody knows why it's there. And then when you remove it, something breaks. Um, but yeah, if anyone has has a good um, testing environment that, that we don't know about, we'd love to hear about it. But that's just the best we've been able to come up with so far. Okay, another question here. Uh, is there a reason you have not gone through the kickers or nano services? Uh, I, yeah, so the kickers, we haven't, uh, that's something that we haven't looked at too much yet. Uh, and we'd like to look into. Um, we, we have a couple ideas for using kickers, like whenever a new device is added to NSO, have it basically run the generic services, bulk, like the bulk exec for the, the batch file for all generic services on it. So then you can just pre-populate the config support for all of those generic services and you're free to just start deploying them. Um, but yeah, we, we haven't started using the kickers yet. Nano services, we would like to for certain service instances, um, but I'm, I'm not certain how much those would help with uh, doing things like where the device comes back and says it doesn't support a command. Um, I don't know, Alan, if you wanna to speak to that anymore. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the other main thing that we have with nano services is that uh, we just don't really know enough about them yet. You know, we've attended last year's uh, labs on nano services, uh, but we're a Python shop and we haven't even really found a single working example of nano services in Python. So, yeah, I think we're definitely open to using that. Uh, we just need to know more about that. Yeah, I guess on that question, is that in relation specifically to devices not supporting commands or to um, like the enterprise type services? I guess I, I don't know if that person could respond to their question again. Um, and, and if Victoria would see it, I don't have the chat up since I'm presenting. <laughs> yeah, so far I don't see a response. Okay, well, maybe we can come back to that later if they get to it. Exactly. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Anyone who has questions, feel free to reach out to us you know, after this as well. <laughs> Yeah, you have a lot of questions. This was a very, very interesting talk. So uh, the next one, it says, uh, great work. This was a very timely for what we deal with in our network. Are you exclusively using config support to solve the issue of multiple models per vendor? 
or is there a mixture of that approach and conditional statements in your templates to determine the device model? Yeah, so um, if, if once again, it depends on how complex your environment is, what you need to implement. I, I had talked to some people who had presented um, at the New York Dev Days. Um, I think Hank Preston was his name and he was in a data center and I think there were two models. One didn't support a command, so he could easily throw an if statement for that and that's all he needs and that's great. Um, that's what we started with. We moved to config support and now we just use config support for everything. It's uh, become very easy and standardized for us to um, develop our services that way. It's, it's a very simple use, um, user interface for the user and it's consistent then for the user as well. Because um, one of the greatest things about it too is you, when there are new devices coming in or devices being upgraded, you don't have to worry about, now. oh, now there's a new model or a new OS we've never dealt with and we have to go back, update the service, and redeploy and push out. Even if you're using Ansible, that can take 30 minutes to an hour and you might have to do it after hours. With this, you can just run that bulk execution command. Um, it will recheck the devices, any changes, it will update that inside of the config support CDB. You redeploy the services, it looks up the X path, and then it adjusts the commands appropriately. So it's just more uh, in line for the changes that are being made. Uh, and just the standardization of the development process to the operator who's using NSO using it is just consistent. Um, so yeah, so we're completely using config support for all of it right now, just because we've built it. All right, thank you. So next question, what are the NSO specific structures or facilities that you utilize for realizing uh, bulk exec and config support? Yeah, so um, the structures for uh, that, that we augmented onto, is, is that the question like that we built upon? I think that's what it's asking. I think maybe, I mean, I don't know if he's talking about the Yang specifically. I mean, what type, I mean, I think you, you kind of saw what the structures look like through the screenshots um, or the videos that were in our presentation. Um, so you can probably see those, uh, uh, you can download them later. Um, but uh, in, in terms of the Python side, it's pretty standard Python. I mean, obviously we're using Python threading to multi-thread the processes and it just uh, it spins up, you know, we have a, a configurable number of threads that you can spin up and each thread is a worker that will just pull off you know, however many uh, tasks are available and work through them until it's all done. Um, and it uses the standard uh, Python libraries, for NSO, uh, the magic and the math. And I'm not sure if that's answering the question. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, I, I guess I think what you're asking is if, if you're asking what did we build upon, um, in, inside of Python, you can basically make the, the calls for live status and config exec, just like you would on the command line. Um, and so you just go through and basically, with all the devices we got, we just made a call for each one. So like for this device, call live status and then pass in the command you gave, or for this device, call config exec with the command you passed in. Um, and so, so we just built upon like the existing things in NSO, like live status, config exec, and then through Python, we figured out how to call them, um, which I think there's, Maybe something on DevHub of how to do that, um, but you can look through the the Py docs for it. Or um, if you want to look at Yang, you can just look at the existing Yang for something like the Cisco IOS Ned. Um, right, the, you can view those Yang files uh, just to see how they structure it and try to mimic that. Um, but yeah, it's just building off of the existing things and then calling them um, through it. A lot of this stuff that's that bulk exec does is basically just managing the commands and the devices you pass it and then pairing them all up and then afterwards writing information to the CDB to the config support just like you would write anything else to the CDB from a Python um, action. Um, I hope that answers the question. I think it was a very, very nice answer. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more question here. Oh, wow. Oh, we are getting even more. So, um, do you also take care of sync from after config exec for each device? Yeah, so that's that's actually a really good question. Um, and that's good because I, I, I didn't um, touch on touch on one of the points uh, very firmly is, so with config exec with something like NTP update calendar, it actually doesn't make a change to the device because there's the question mark at the end. So it's not pushing any configuration to the device. It's completely safe to do as long as you have that question mark at the beginning. 
Um, I would say test it in your lab first. Uh, the Cisco Nexus uh, NED would send the command with a question mark and then it'd send it again without. Um, so you want to test it in your lab first. The iOS NED works fine. Nexus now works fine. Um, but there are certain commands that you can only check if you enter into like a level. Like if you enter into an interface, then you can check a command beneath it. Um, and so with those, you have to do multi-line commands with the semicolon, right? And then you on the second command, you put the question mark. So anything you do to enter into something to check something below it, those will write configurations to your device. So you have to be very careful with that and know that you're okay with writing that configuration to your device. Um, so, so that's one thing you have to be really careful with. And if you do do that, then yes, the configuration on the device will change and you will have to do a sync from after. Um, so yeah, so basically what we would do is basically, you know, for all of the iOS devices, you know, af after doing like, you know, smaller amounts of testing, right? You hit, you hit the devices with your, your tested commands. All the commands have been tested. They're approved and verified in your file, your batch file. Um, you use that file, you hit all of the devices, right? Maybe it's eight commands uh, times 800 devices and you run all of those lines, you check it, updates can fix support. Now you're out of sync with all of those devices. If, if there are multi-liners, if there are no multi-liners, you're completely fine and you're done. If there are multi-liners, then you do have to sync from the devices after uh, to get those changes. Um, and then depending on if you're okay with a clean or dirty environment, right? If there are those commands where it's the one that's being written to the device, you might want to have a template or something else after to remove those commands that you put onto the device to check subcommands. Um, so that, that's another thing you do have to think about. There's not a great solution for that. And that's just because these devices weren't built with automation in mind. So you have to kind of check them dirty, but um, that's the best we've come up with for it. All right, uh, I think uh, let, let's have one more question and then and then we, we, we close the session. So the question is that are, um, yeah, so what are you guys using for your source of truth? It's a very interesting question. Um, yeah, so that, that one's, as, as Alan said, most of the changes are made out of band outside of NSO. Um, so currently all of our services are the source of truth for the service. And then the devices in real life are the source of truth for device configuration. Um, so what we do basically is just, we assume the device is correct and we'll sync from the devices. And then if services are out of sync, we'll redeploy services. And um, the idea is eventually we'll have like a nightly test that could check that. And any of the services that come out of sync, you can check you know, who made the change on the device. And then you can go and say like, hey, this is handled by the service. Please don't touch that. So our services remain their source of truth. Everything else currently on the device. We eventually want to get to the case where everything is handled by NSO. So that's the source of truth and all changes go through NSO and we don't allow people to log into devices otherwise. Um, but it, it's a slow process to get there. And so you have to allow the out-of-band changes and you have to accept those as being more true. Um, and then use your services as a constant kind of, are we in sync? If not, redeploy. If it's an issue, who's making the change, then you can have a talk with them and be like, hey, we're trying to use this method for handling these configurations. We have standards or policies for it. Um, and that's how we've approached it. All right, thank you very much. Um, so I think it's time to finish this session. Uh, thank you, Samuel and Alan. I think it was an excellent talk and we got a lot of really interesting questions and very good answers. So, even though this session is ending, the Developer Days has just begun. So, check the Cisco event app for the upcoming sessions, games and more. Thank you very much for attending. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Yep, thanks and feel free to hit us up if you have other questions.